Hello, my name is Zach Jenkins. I'm an Associate Professor of Pharmacy Practice at Cedarville University and a Clinical Specialist in Infectious Diseases. And for this week's COVID-19 update, I'll be discussing the role of interleukin receptor inhibitors in managing patients with COVID-19. At the time of this week's recording, we now have over 1.7 million cases of the coronavirus being reported worldwide and over 500,000 cases being reported domestically. In recent weeks, we've seen the number of cases rise significantly in some parts of the United States, uh, specifically New York and New Jersey come to mind. And as we've looked at those cases, we've been, cons we've been increasingly concerned because our healthcare system capacity has been fairly taxed in those locations. And because of this, the role of treatment is becoming a larger and larger focus as, as we think about how to best not only manage these patients, but get them out the door more quickly to free up healthcare resources for others that may need them. To that end, the media has been releasing a lot of coverage when it comes to how there may be treatment options out there for the coronavirus. Here are the different options that may be available. And we talked a lot last week about hydroxychloroquine, which has been featured very frequently in the media. But there have been some other agents discussed as well. And so specifically, um, earlier in, in March, Governor Cuomo ended up putting out a statement about how they were going to be investigating several different agents, not only including hydroxychloroquine, but also these interleukin-6 receptor inhibitors. So what are these agents? What are these interleukin-6 receptor inhibitors? So originally these agents were used in uh, some immune system disorders, such as rheumatoid arthritis. We've had some experience though as we've looked at these agents where we've seen some success when they were used in the setting of other coronaviruses for, for decreasing the inflammation that was seen in those cases. And looking specifically at COVID-19, there's been some literature being published talking about how tocilizumab, which is one of these interleukin-6 receptor inhibitors, talking specifically about how this agent may play a role in uh, decreasing the cytokine release syndrome or cytokine storm. So. Let's back up here for a second. You may remember this diagram from last week describing one of the big things we're concerned about with COVID-19, and that being acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this condition seems to be caused by this excessive immune response that some patients face, and it leads to impaired oxygen exchange. So how does this cytokine storm occur? How does this excessive immune response occur? That's a very big focus when we think about the role of these interleukin-6 receptor inhibitors. And for that reason, we're going to be diving more deeply into that. So if you do remember, we've also discussed how the virus ends up taking over a host cell and making more and more of itself by using the cell's own machinery. What can happen over time, though, is as more and more particles start to accumulate, more and more virus is being made, the cell becomes overwhelmed and ends up bursting or lysing. And so all those particles get dispersed. So we have these damaged particles floating around. So keep those in mind because they'll become important in one moment. So in our bodies, um, when we think about our lungs, our lungs have something called alveoli. And alveoli are kind of like leaves on a tree. So you have branches of the lungs and then you have leaves on the tree. And those leaves or alveoli end up increasing our ability to exchange oxygen. So they increase surface area much like a leaf does on a plant and they allow gas exchange. And so you have many, many, many of these in the lungs, but what ends up happening in COVID-19 is these end up becoming damaged or overwhelmed in some cases. But under normal circumstances, you have normal oxygen flow. But if you remember, with the virus causing damage to cells in the alveoli, what will happen is we have all these particles floating around and those particles trigger a white blood cell called a macrophage to actually release something called cytokines. And so what are cytokines? Cytokines are basically cell messengers. They're, they're chemical messengers that get distributed throughout the body to enact various effects. One specific cytokine that gets released in these cases is interleukin-6. And we think it plays a very significant role because there are receptors for it all throughout the body. Uh, not all cytokines have that same kind of, kind of setup. But interleukin-6 has receptors all throughout the body, including organs and the nervous system. And as it starts to impact the, or uh, excuse me, interact with those cells in those areas, it induces this inflammatory response, which one thing that interleukin-6 is very well known for is fever. If you think about COVID-19 and the symptoms we typically think of, that's the number one symptom most patients will have. Um, but it induces fever, antibody production, fluid migration, uh, accumulation of white cells, and other things you might typically think of. So in normal patients, that's not 
too much of an issue. But in the case of an excessive immune response, what can happen is you have flu this fluid migration where fluid leaves the blood cell, or, or le excuse me, leaves your blood vessels, and you don't have the amount of blood flow that you normally would have to your organs. So you can have some organ dysfunction occur, organ damage occur in some cases. Now on top of that, you also have this idea of ARDS. So both interleukin-6 and other cytokines, um, they ultimately can cause an accumulation of fluid in this space between the alveolus and your capillaries, which supply blood to your heart. And so what happens is, as that fluid accumulates, you have decreased flow. So for the rest of our body, that means not only do we potentially have decreased blood flow, we have decreased oxygen flow as well. So you can see why that can become a big, big problem. But what does this term storm mean? How, how does that play a role here? So macrophages, again, release interleukin-6 and other cytokines. So what happens with interleukin-6 as it gets dispersed throughout the body? Well, it ends up finding target cells. And specifically, it's looking for these receptors on target cells. And the idea is that it binds to this receptor and ends up sending a signal to the cell to perform some action. So it's a messenger. What ends up happening then is the immune response is triggered. So the cell interprets the message, it triggers an immune response. And ultimately, one thing you see released a lot of are these white blood cells. So they get released and they start migrating to the site of a given infection or a given threat that the body's perceiving. So normally that's not too much of an issue, but unfortunately one thing to consider is many of these white blood cells also can release cytokines and specifically interleukin-6. So the storm, this idea of a storm, is really this idea of a positive feedback loop that occurs as you dump more cytokines in your system, it causes more white blood cells to release, it causes more cytokines to release, and you start to have this cycle that occurs. So in excessive amounts, this becomes a very, very big threat to people. So the idea behind an interleukin-6 receptor inhibitor is it will block interleukin-6 or, or impair its ability to bind with those target sites. So you still have some activity that occurs, but it starts to bind in location so you don't maybe have the full response that you might otherwise see. So the two interleukin-6 receptor antagonists or inhibitors that we actually have uh, been using for COVID-19 include tocilizumab and cerilumab. And both of these agents have been studied historically for rheumatoid arthritis. Now what I'll mention about tocilizumab specifically is this one, at least at this time, has the most literature uh, regarding using it in COVID-19 compared to cerilumab. But cerilumab is actively being investigated. So what are the pros and cons behind these agents? Well, one nice thing is it doesn't take a lot of these agents to enact an effect. So it's a limited number of injections if you use an injection or a lim limited number of infusions that, that you'd need. We think it makes a lot of sense from a mechanistic perspective because we're basically ramping down the immune response so it's not quite as severe in some of our patients. And our prior experience with these agents makes, it so, makes us somewhat comfortable with using them. But there are some significant limitations. Uh, probably the largest one on the list is the fact that it can induce other infections because if you think about it, you're decreasing an immune response and that may allow other infections to occur. Now, most patients don't have this happen but we do know from the literature there is a significant increase in the risk when you do use these agents. Another thing that can happen is damage to, to your liver, as well as in some pretty severe cases, a decrease in the overall release of white blood cells. There are a lot of, uh, I guess, there's been a lot of discussion to you about whether or not drug interactions are a big concern with tocilizumab. Um, what I'll say at this time is just a lot of things out there but maybe not quite as concrete as what we could say with hydroxychloroquine. But it's something that from a healthcare provider perspective, we certainly keep on our minds. One thing that will impact a lot of people though, is the fact that these, these agents are indeed costly. Uh, to receive a full course of therapy, it's thousands of dollars, as opposed to a far uh, less significant cost when you think about something like hydroxychloroquine. What is important to recognize though, is this can be layered on top of hydroxychloroquine and other treatments potentially, um, to, to, to kind of combine all these mechanisms for a possible effect. Uh, when you do that, you increase your risk of side effects. Obviously, there's some other limitations to that as well, but it's something to think about. So where do we lie with our current evidence? Well, the, the short end of it is this, we don't have a lot. In fact, there was only, at least that I'm aware of, only one trial that's been published to date, 
and it was published out of China and it looked at 21 patients, so it's a small sample size, and this had a single arm. So what that means is it had no control group, so no real comparison of people without the therapy. So what that makes, us, makes it hard for us to do is to interpret whether this was better at all than what a standard of care is in patients. Uh, we, it's hard to, to look at them and say, well, based on their experience, we know it would work in our patients. So that, that's really hard to, to kind of generalize. Another limitation is that it was a retrospective study. So what that really means is we're looking backwards at data. And anytime when you look backwards at data, it's easier to introduce bias. You can kind of look just for the positives and ignore the negatives, even if you may not always mean to. What, but the study did actually find two things. They reported that they saw a significant decrease in mortality in their patients and that they also observed no real harm occur in their study. Now it's hard to again interpret what the mortality difference may mean because we can't uh, generalize that to other populations. But what we can say is we know based on our historical use of this agent, we know absolutely it can cause harm. So for whatever reason, they just didn't see it in their, in their population. And this may be a case where maybe that small sample size played a role. So what's going on right now? At this point in time, we have about 15 st studies for tocilizumab and six studies for uh, cerilumab being conducted in the setting of COVID-19. Probably the largest trial though is looking at the use of uh, tocilizumab by the World Health Organization, in that solidarity trial. Now, if you ever hop on clinicaltrials.gov and you look for this information, one thing you'll see is some of these things are ongoing in the recruiting patients, others actually have started. So it tells you the status of the studies. It's about a 50-50 split between studies at this point that have started and others that are still enrolling patients and haven't started yet. So hopefully in, in, a, in a month or two months, we'll have a better idea of, of where we're at with treatment with these agents. But one thing to keep in mind though, is we don't, fully understand the immune response that's generated in the setting of COVID-19 yet. Our data is pretty limited. Um, more recently, while, while ARDS or ARDS has been a big, big focus as a problem we know that occurs with COVID-19, we've seen some evidence to suggest that maybe, maybe uh, that this disease ends up causing damage to the hemoglobin molecule in red blood cells. And for hemoglobin, for those that may not know, is a molecule that ends up grabbing on the oxygen and allowing it to be transported throughout your body in the red blood cells. So they think it may damage those hemoglobin molecules. And so what that means for us is we don't know the optimal way to treat patients still. Is it this agent? Do you use it all the time? Do you use it some of the time? So where does that leave us with these inhibitors? So at this point in time, we, we tend to think that this could be a reasonable treatment strategy, but the evidence is very, very limited at this point in time. And we are concerned because they can pose an infection risk, and so they may not always be the best in all patients. The cost may also be a limitation in some, case, some cases for patients if they're not able to actually afford the payment or if the health system can't afford the payment. Um, and because we don't understand the optimal use, we also we also don't know when should we use these, when when should we should should we limit the immune system to respond, and when should we allow the immune system to respond? Because we know the immune system has to play a role in managing the disease itself. So all these things together leave us with a lot of questions that we still have to ask about interleukin six inhibitors. But at this point in time, we do know these agents may again be some sort of treatment strategy that we can consider. Hopefully we'll have more information in the future. That concludes this week's discussion on interleukin-6 receptor inhibitors. Thank you.